My name is Julie Pearson, Little Thunder. Today is Tuesday, April 14th, 2015, and I'm interviewing Chickasaw Bladesmith Daniel Worcester for the Oklahoma Native Artist Project, sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. Daniel, you describe your work with knives as neo-traditionalist. Your elegantly designed pieces have won you numerous competitive awards and museum shows, including an exhibit at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. Among other honors, you're an inductee into the Chickasaw Hall of Fame and a former Red Earth honored one. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Well, I'm glad you came. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Ardmore, about six miles from here, and I grew up, I'd say, the first six years of my life. My dad was a professional rodeo, bareback, saddle bronc rider, so we traveled around the country and from different places, and uh, so uh, I guess I grew up uh, in hotels and motels and at rodeos <laughs> and things like that, but uh, then after... He uh, he got hurt rodeoing, and uh, so we he bought a ranch down in uh, right around Stewart, Oklahoma, and uh, he bought a ranch down there. I think it's like 1,800 acres. It's a really big big ranch, and really seemed huge to a little kid. And but it was uh, kind of wild and woolly down there, <laughs> and we uh, we stayed there for a while for maybe year and a half and then he bought this place here right outside Ardmore and we moved here and I grew up here and this is what I call home and spent 12 years in Long Grove School graduated from there and right out of high school went to one month out of high school I went to work for Southwestern Bell slash AT&T and I spent about 38 years there and, uh, well, um, so your mom, what did she do for a living? Well, she she uh, broke horses and she was a jockey. She was okay. very much in, uh, very good with horses, and uh, as well as a housewife. But as far as having any occupation outside the home, other than breaking horses, and and she. She you, raised horses too. We raised think. horses, yeah, and and back then um, there were brush tracks all around, race tracks, and uh, matter of fact, from here I could walk right over the hill, and every Sunday I'd walk over there or ride my horse, and they'd have like a four gate race track, and it was really fun to just go over there, and she'd ride, and, and, and it, it's a quarter horses, and. So it was, uh, but they'd go all over the state as far as cool. brush tracks is what we called them. Right. And but they were really fun, and you you could learn a lot as a kid. Um, so was the Chickasaw on your mom's side or your dad's side? It's on my both? father's side. On your dad's he side. grew up right north of. Uh, he was born right north of Pontotoc, south of Ada, and uh, and my that's it. So Chickasaw's from his side of the family. Right. And how about brothers or sisters? Uh, I had uh, one half brother, and he passed away here about 15 years ago. But other than that, I was the only child. What were some of the places that you, your dad rodeoed around in that you have memories of? Uh, I've got vague memories of them, uh, uh, Ben's because he, I was so young, but I do remember. Uh, Going up into New York, Niagara Falls, uh, some of those places like that, and but before, before uh, uh, him and my mom was married, you know he'd rode you all over, and uh, you know it'd be like four or five of them traveling in a car, and they'd go one rodeo this day and one rodeo the next day. But of course, after I came along, I'm sure it kind of slowed them down, <laughs> slowed them down a little bit, but. Uh, just just traveling all along and uh and after he, he we got this place and he uh he got a job as a ranch foreman and he stayed there till he retired working on a ranch 
uh, what was your relationship with your grandparents on either side of your family? Well, my grandparents from my mother's side were raised all here, and uh, we spent a lot of time with them. We'd, we'd go down to my, my dad's mom on, uh, uh, oh, maybe two or three times uh, a year to see her, and, uh, but... Where did she live? She lived right at the old uh, original allotment place right uh, right north of uh, Pontotoc. And how important was your Chickasaw heritage growing up? Well, it was it was really important as far as uh, you know what as far as uh, who you were. You, I just knew I was Chickasaw, and I never um, uh, you know doubted it or anything you know when we went to my grandmother she spoke a lot of Chickasaw and of course my dad and he, he'd do it and he'd teach me some uh, some of the Chickasaw words and uh, some of the Chickasaw slang words. Great so you're around the language a little bit. Yes. What kind of um, art were you exposed to in the home? In the home there was uh, I guess in the home as far as art they're just uh, pictures on the wall, that sort of thing, you know, as a child. And but I was took a early interest in art as far as I was always drawing and coloring and things like that, and making things, little sculptures and things, whittling. I like to whittle a lot. Okay. And uh, actually, I've got a scar here on this finger from when I cut myself. I've still got a scar, and on this finger here. From where my cousin cut me, he was whittling with a knife, and I wanted that, and I reached, and that knife slit, and oh. I looked, and I said, that looks pretty bad, and I ran about a half a mile all the way home, <laughs> and, and had it doctored up, but I, that's amazing how that scar is still there, but yeah, we used to uh, always do things like that. It, you know, back then, all boys pretty much carried pocket knives, and there was a game we all played called Mumbly Peg. And we'd uh, play that and, and you know, even play it at school and well, no one ever bothered anybody with it or anything, but it was, you know, but and it's... It's throwing that, do you want to explain? Mumbly Peg is a weird little game. <laughs> <laughs> it, you, you take a folded knife and you, you bring the blades out and then you flip it and if it sticks, then you get to hammer the peg into the ground. And if it doesn't, then then the other guy does it, and it goes around and round, and and finally someone has to pull the peg out of the ground with their mat, with their teeth, and you know everybody just gets a big laugh out of it because when they come up, they've got dirt and mud all over their face. <laughs> That's not the winner that gets to do that, right? No, no, I, I think not. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, as far you know, and then uh, as far as art at school, uh, there wasn't any art at school, but I, I loved drawing at school. Uh, you know, everybody would come to me and they'd say, "Will you draw this picture? Will you draw that picture?" And I loved just drawing, uh, and I did that at the house and everything. And, uh, but it was just always I was always interested in art. Do you remember being exposed to any native art specifically, or the first time you might have run across them? Native As a interest. child, no. No, I don't remember any. And in middle school and high school, were you also encouraged? Did you also take art? And there wasn't any art at my school ever. Okay. And so, you know, it, but still, I, I still, I draw everything. And kind of a story I remember was when we got to the seventh grade, we, uh, every year at the state fair, the school would have buses and you'd get to go up to the state fair for the day, which was, you know, when we was in first through sixth, you, you didn't get to do that, but when you got seventh grade, that, I guess they thought you was big enough to do something. <laughs> so anyway, I got five dollars and I got to go up to the state fair and me and my buddies, we all, you know, just running wild, having a good time at the fair and, and uh, I had five dollars, but I knew it had to last all day and I wanted to do something really neat with it and I didn't, and didn't just want to go to the shows. Or I rode a few rides and I had about two dollars left. I didn't eat or drink anything because I, I knew I've got. And I ran across 
this art booth where you could make your own pictures. And it was a crazy deal. It spun around and you could put the different uh, colors in it and it'd make your own picture. And it was a dollar. And I thought, and the, the guy said, come on, let's go get to this uh, show here. They're fixing to have another show. Let's go see it. And I said, no, I'm going to do this. And I did that. And uh, I, I paid that for it. And uh, to this day, I, I kept that and I've got it in my office. <laughs> and what's really funny is I've got other artwork I'm in there from really good artists. And when the grandkids come in, I'll say, your poppy did one of these pictures. And uh, my little granddaughter looked around and she pointed at the one I did and she said, yeah, poppy, I bet that's it right there. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, well, a kid can see. <laughs> I thought I'd fool her for a while, but no. <laughs> that is funny. Well, just quickly in terms of school then, even though you were just drawing and painting on your own when you could, or drawing, did did your teachers kind of recognize your talent? Yeah, yeah, I had several teachers, they'd say, you know, I'd say, uh, go to the office. <laughs> we're not going to be doing that in here, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but that I did have, I remember one teacher that said, that's really good, Danny. I, I, you know, you did a good job there in the show. You know, it you know, made you feel good. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> So, you mentioned that after high school, why don't you tell us again what happened after high school? After high school, uh, a month after I graduated, I went to work for Southwestern Bell. And uh, then in the August, I married my wife, Debbie, and we, I worked, and first thing, within the first six months of living, we bought a, we bought a new little trailer house, and it was great, and I, I told Debbie, I said, you know, we've got to get some artwork in here. I said, these walls just look bare, <laughs> and so I, <laughs> I went and bought a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, boards and painted all kinds of pictures and stuff, and we hung them all up, and uh Friends would come over and they'd look at that and they'd just kind of say, what's that? You know, I'd, I'd say, well, I painted that. I said, they'd say, what is it? And I'd say, well, I'm not really sure what it is, but uh, what do you think? And they'd just say, oh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> but I knew they were thinking, what is that? But, but yeah, I kept on with, with art. Like were they that. sort of semi-abstract, too? Yeah, they were. I, I always liked lines but I, you know as far as symmetrical lines this and way but I did do uh, like birds and different things like that painting mm. but I was always uh, but for a whole time uh, I'd always just have me some paints and stuff and go and paint and something to do with art and you weren't doing anything connected with art at your job right what, what no. did you do at Southwestern Bell well what I did there was I uh, was uh, all kinds. I, I think I did about everything. For, uh, fix cut cables, repair lines, uh, uh, go in people's houses, install phones, and uh, and and probably went into six or seven houses a day. You got to meet a lot of different people and see see how uh, a lot of different people lived and everything. And that was really a good learning experience to to meet different people every day. And so I did that, and I didn't, but I just kept on with my... See some different art, too, probably. Really did. And, that, and, and honestly, that exposed me to some art, going into people's houses. And, and we talk about it. You, you always see something there in somebody's house. Oh, wow, there's a Navajo rug. They, and, they did. and they were always, most people really like to show and tell what their art was. And so it was just like, a, it wouldn't like being confined in an office or a factory job all day. It was just like every day was a learning experience, you know. You might see a little piece of art, a statue or anything. And, and that people really always like to tell you and, and talk about their art because they're proud of it. So when did you, while you're working, when did you get back into three-dimensional work and how did you end up in knives? Well, that's, yeah, uh, I just would, I was just kind of antsy about it. I knew there was something I wanted to do with art, but I just never could put my finger on it. And I seen this um, ad for a bladesmithing school in the 
Texarkana, Arkansas, which was an extension of Texarkana up north at, at uh, Washington, Arkansas. And so I told Debbie, I said, look here, there, this looks kind of intriguing. I what, wonder what it's all about. And, and so she said, well, you need to find out a little more about it. So I called and I found out. And what it was, it was uh, the bladesmithing schools where you could make your own blades. And I said, wow, that seems neat. You make your own blades. You don't just grind things off, but you actually go through the whole process. And so anyway, I, I found out all about it, and I told her, and she, uh, she said, well, you need to go do that. And I said, well, I hate to leave here and leave you for, it was two-week school. A two-week school. I hate to leave you with two kids, three kids, and um, uh, old pickup, because we had an old pickup and an old car, or, or a newer car, a Monte Carlo, and she took out the Monte Carlo keys and said, you go down to that school. <laughs> So I and how old were you? Oh, it was in 1989. Okay. So I can't remember. I'd have to figure up how old <laughs> I was. The, the way I always say it, I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a good experience as far as I went. And I, learned. And I just, it, it just seemed like I just absorbed it, you know, I just ate it up. But I finally had my hands on something that, that I could actually do. but. But it was just for the blades. You learn how to make the blades and everything. So after that was through, I came home. And, you know, I'm thinking, now I've got to go see what I can do with it as far as handle Handles. and everything like that. So I gathered up all my equipment and everything. It was, that was a process, uh, buying for, I'd go to auctions and sales and try to find things that were, uh, you know, uh, used that you could put together and I wound up putting together everything and, and that was uh, probably about a year and a half, two year project just getting everything together. And if you've never made a handle before and you've not had the opportunity to watch anybody else make a knife handle, that must have been kind of a challenge. Well, it, it was, and, I, and uh, I bought a little book, and it was kind of explaining how to do it and everything. And, of course, you know, you read books, and there's nothing like hands-on experience. <laughs> so <laughs> through trial and error, I, I managed to, to muddle through it and get it done. And then there was all these knife books you could, you could get at the store and everything and read and about all the, the experts, how they did it and everything. And I... And I get those books and I'd look at them and uh, and I'd try to do this or try to do that and, and finally I said I'm not getting another book and I, I threw every knife book I had away and I just said I'm gonna just do it on my own and <laughs> I did and I've never gotten another knife book. <laughs> <laughs> and was it partly because what you were trying was not working? It's partly. Based on your reading? It, it, the my it's with me it's that I can't follow instructions and, and you know if I'm if I'm there and somebody's showing me something I can pick it up you know like that but to read it it just doesn't compute <laughs> <laughs> so you're working this you're working your job too at the same time and then when you come home at night or on the In weekends the you're tinkering yeah with the night. weekends when did you um decide, okay, now I know how to do this, I'm going to make a few of these, and I'm going to do something with them. Well, I, I finally finished one now, and that was my whole goal, really, is just to make one for myself, because I, was, I always admired custom knives, but I couldn't afford one. And I thought, well, the 500 I spent for my school, I can probably, say, at some point, make a knife that I can say is mine, and that will cover the expenses. <laughs> I won't have to buy one. But I actually finally finished my first knife and I was just really proud of it. You know, it looked it looked terrible, but you know, it was usable and the 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 blade looked real good, but the handle was really funny looking. And uh, and but and then somebody came by and I guess they I, I probably showed it to them and they said, "Wow, that's neat." They said that's pretty good, and I thought, it is, you know. <laughs> and so I thought, 
hmm, I'll make another one. I'll try to do a little better. And, and uh, I just kept piddling and making one. And finally, someone told me, they said, you know, you should go, your chicken saw, you, you could go up to Red Earth. And I said, what's Red Earth? And they said, well, it's, a, it's this uh, show, you know, and if you're Indian, you can get in. And, uh, you know, and if you do artwork or what you're doing there, <laughs> you can probably get in and, uh, you know, see. And I thought, well, that sounds neat. I think I'll try it. And I made a few calls and finally found out and um, I got an application and I sent it in. I think back then you had to do uh, like a, I can't remember if it was slides or photographs, but, but I'd always had 35 millimeter camera, so taking photographs, that was fun with me. But anyway, I sent it in the first year and they sent back a letter and said, sorry, but we're, thank you for entering, but you know, Better luck next time. <laughs> and I you, thought you didn't uh, get accepted. The yeah, first but time. you know it didn't bother me a bit. I thought, oh wow, I'm gonna, that just said. I just told myself, I said, hmm, I'm gonna try to do a little better, you know. And then the next year, I sent in, and I was accepted. And so I was really happy. I was just, wow, I'm going to a real art show. And <laughs> and from the beginning, I imagine your handles were. Um, had you already developed this kind of sort of in inlay look that no that hadn't okay. came yet okay what what I had was pretty much what would people would say the traditional knife oh okay like a bone or a deer antler or or wooden handle and uh, and that's pretty much where I was at at that time all right what was it like when you got into Red Earth the following year oh gosh it was fantastic I was seeing all this great artwork there and uh, you know visiting with different artists and uh, and uh, not selling anything but that's okay <laughs> I was just happy to be there you know and uh, and uh, but and then somebody came by and bought something and I thought wow that's, that's that's pretty neat to sell something you know that means they like it too and uh, and it was just a real neat experience and uh, I and got to meet good buddy of mine, Benjamin Harjo, he came by. It was the first year I met him, and he, we talked, and he said, Daniel, he said, you need to see about going out to Indian Market. And I said, where's that? <laughs> and he said, Santa Fe. And I said, well, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> and, uh, and, but, and, and, I, and after I got through talking to Ben, and uh, we came home, and I, I was just, uh, I was telling Debbie, I said, you know, I just can't believe an artist like Benjamin Harjo would would tell me to that my work was good because he told me yeah he liked that and he told me I could go down to Santa Fe to Indian Market and I mean it, to have Ben tell me that I was just wow you know I I mean that was really encouragement and uh, <laughs> I guess I was just just uh, encourageable. <laughs> So how did you um, then find this other style of working with the, the handles? Well, that's that's pretty neat. Uh, I got. I mean, it was probably the first time you'd seen Ben's work, which is yeah, exactly. a lot of times very geometric. It, it was. It was very colorful. It was very colorful, and I was really impressed with the way the colors were and everything. And uh, and I mean, it stuck in my mind all those colors and. Uh, then I, sit, I, I wound up getting an application, and I did send it out to Santa Fe, and I got in out there. How many years is this after Red Earth? I want to say a year, the, the, it was Red Earth, and then it was like maybe the next year. Wow. And I sent in to Santa Fe, and they said they accepted me, but they and I told them what I did, but they wanted me to... Uh, Fords. They wanted me to do a demonstration, and I thought, wow, that's really good. I'd like to do that out there, you know, because I, I enjoyed, I'd, I'd been to s several spots around here as far as uh, just showing how I forge, and I, so I was ready to go, and they called me, and they said, well, we're going to have to cancel that, <laughs> and I said, what, why, what happened? They said, we've got a drought this year, and, and the fire marshal won't let them do any kind of open flames or and they want to know is that what you had and I said yeah I've got a cold fire forged and that would be probably dangerous so so anyway they let me 
share booth instead of giving me my own booth, and I did that. And, and then the next year, uh, uh, I'd known Les Berryhill, and he's a good friend of mine, him and Pat, and we, I got together with him, and we shared a booth for the the following year, and we've been sharing ever since. But as far as, uh, but I was still doing my traditional type artwork pieces, and um, so I started. Unless he gave me some old dominoes, he said was his dad, and he said you might try using these, you know, if you can on your, your handles and things. And I thought, well, okay, I'll try that. And uh, I brought them home and I, I laid them over on my shop desk, and I never tried them. I was still doing with the wood and the bone and, and things like that and then one day I just was out of material as far as um, uh, my traditional wood and bone and I seen his dominoes over there and I tried them and I thought wow that's neat how, how those dominoes look and everything and I started putting a little bit of inlay in them but they were white dominoes and they weren't any color or anything but still and then the next year I, I kind of mixed them up with the traditional, but they, they still look traditional, and at that time I was leaving the dominoes showing the, the dots on it, mm -hmm. and people were saying, that's neat, they're like that, and uh, then the next year, or it might have been the year after, I did that a couple of years, and I got, you know, I, I was picking up collectors and everything, and they were liking what I did, especially when I forged my own blade, I could have all kinds of neat designs as far as the blade was, and then I ran on to some uh, billiard balls and, I, and some old colored dominoes, and I put that with there. And I made I made one knife that was all different colors. And at that time they had a miniature category, and I made a, a small one like that too. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, wow, this, these are pretty. I like these. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna make some more of them like not like that, but using these colors. So I went out to. Of course, you go out to Santa Fe, and you're out there early to enter your work. And, and I went to enter it, and I'm just happy as could be with these pieces. And the person that I sat down at the table with to look at them, she looked at them, and she said, Where'd you get these out of Cracker Jacks? And when she said that, oh. it just felt like, oh, somebody stuck a heart in my knife. I thought, uh-oh. This, they're not going to accept, they're not going to like this. I said, this isn't good. <laughs> and I said, she said, we, we can't take this. What did you make these out of? And I said, well, I found some old dominoes and I found some old beer balls and I had some old silver and I used for inlay. And she said, well, let's go out. I'm going to go check with the director. And I could see them over there talking and they, you know, going back and forth and all the time I'm thinking, Wow, most of my pieces I brought are like this. This isn't going to be a good day. And so then she came back and she said, Well, he said it'd be okay. He said, Means you found your material and uh, and everything. And he, she said, this, this is just different material that no one's ever, she's never seen anybody bring in. I said, Well, I understand. And I said, So I was happy they, they took it. And then when went about my business. And then come Friday night, the art preview came up. And I'd seen on the table, I'd won a first place on my big knife and a first place on my miniature. And I it just, <laughs> man, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I thought, well, wow. So I, and then the collectors, they really they really did like that type of work. And, 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 and doing it, I was kind of torn between doing things like that because I knew I was going to alienate some collectors because they, I built up a pretty good following of collectors that liked the traditional stuff, but there just wasn't anywhere else to go with the tradition. I mean, you know, you, it's, it was boring. I was bored with it, so I had to leave it behind and go to something else, and this was the way I wanted to go, And but I was just hoping, well, the, there'll be new collectors, but I was really surprised. Most of my old collectors, they were in love with it. And, my, and I picked up a lot of new collectors. and So every year I've been picking up new collectors, and it's been great. So they, they followed you into the new Yes, time. they did, yeah. and that, that was really, it was, it was a, you know, it was kind of scary because you think, you know, you're going to make people not want what you've gotten, but yet that's what you want to do. So in the end, you know, it was really what you want to do. And I'm still that way today. I, I, I look for all, all kinds of new things, and different ways to do things and I think yeah, it would be it would be really boring if you didn't 
That's a great story. They, they just didn't know how to categorize you. <laughs> <laughs> so what role does um, Debbie play in your art business? It's kind of a two-person deal a lot of times. It's well, uh, she provides uh, good moral support and she, uh, she, uh, she's a good critic. I mean, she'll see things and she'll say, say look, well, why did you do it like this or, or like that? And I'll look at it and I'll say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she she's she's good to bounce new ideas off of, and uh, and sometimes she'll say, Hey, I really do like that, you know. And uh, but she does. She, as far as in the business, you know, she uh, she says that's yours, and you you know you <laughs> you do it. You've done good so far. You just keep on doing it. Um, you have a neat kind of website. Did she help with that or? Oh, I don't have a website. Oh, you don't? No. Okay. Well, you, I, you know what? I bet I was on Chicksaw Nation website. The Chicksaw Nation. They have a yeah, really yeah. nice website. They do. Yeah. They do that. Oh, in fact, yeah, I didn't see a website for you. That's a need to correct that. Um, so, how did you figure out to pr how to price your work? Well, that's, it was just, uh, I, whatever, uh, that was, you know, you just gradually, you just put a price out there thinking, well, from what other things that you've seen, you know, and time-wise, you can't really show your time on anything. But as far as uh, uh, what would something like that be worth to someone, and and that's that's about the only way I could do it. And uh, and pricing is kind of a hard thing to do because you never really know. You put a price out there. You have to put a price that you're comfortable with receiving for your time. But then you wonder, well, is anybody going to pay that? Or, and, and, you know, then you just kind of see how it goes and, and equal, lets it equal out. And then you, you think, well, this is a happy medium. The customer's happy and I'm happy. So. And when you win at Santa Fe, that's sort of a different pricing. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, it, it, well. Can be, it can be, but I've never uh, adjusted with winning on with the first prize place. winner. Yeah, as far as uh, I've just priced them in what in whatever the price was there, whether I won or didn't, it, it'd be that that way. One uh, I did a uh, in nineteen I want to say nineteen six seven eighty ninety nine I think it was ninety nine that I made a pair of spurs and I won the grand I won the challenge award. And I was real happy with that, and I really had no idea in the world what price to put on a pair of spurs. And uh, but I, I put the price out there, and the collector was happy to get it. And uh, and they they'd never bought a knife from me, but they just came by because they seen the spurs. And uh, so that that was one thing, you know, you just like pricing. Who knows? Right. So what did you charge for your spurs? I think they were around eighteen hundred. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I I think I made another pair for the next year, and that was it. Uh, um, I just got into spurs. It was just one of those things that was uh, different, and I mm -hmm. wanted to try. And my dad, with his rodeo experience, he he knew some old spur makers, and he told me how to make them. And uh, as far as from one piece, so they weren't welded; they were just one piece each spur. And so I wanted to try it, Vincy, he told me about it, and uh, I tried that. And, but what I found out with spurs is uh, I really don't care to make anymore after two or three pairs is because you have to make the other one identical. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and that's kind of boring. <laughs> so if I if I'm going to do anything that's boring, I, it doesn't last long. What other kinds of things do you make besides knives? Well, as far as usually, I'll start my, sh my shop up here in uh, March when it warms up because it's warm weather. My shop outside. I do the silver inlay and and things like that inside the tedious things but outside where I forge my blades and everything it's outside and I like warm weather so I'll start maybe in March and 
finish up in November and when it starts getting cool. But during the winter months, I, I'm making jewelry. I like making jewelry. Sometimes I'll just paint and and uh, do that. And uh, uh, this past year, I did a little bit of. I, I put together a book that I've been writing, or as far as uh, as far as uh, wanted to get it together. Right. So every every year. I do something to keep me going, During and then, the winter. And then when, I, when I'm ready to start back up, it seems like I'm invigorated and ready to go again because, you know, you, everything I found that I do, whether it's jewelry or whatever, I can, I can, it seems like I can relate it to my knives and different ideas and handles and things like that. So every year's a new year, you know, it just, who knows what it's going to be. That's neat. Um, what other shows then do you do besides um, Santa Fe and Red Earth? I'll do the Chickasaw Festival, and it's a, uh, it's uh, it was being held in Tishomingo in uh, October, but now they've started a new festival, which is going to be sulfur at the Artesian every May, and so it's it's going to there's big hopes for it to really grow, and. Uh, that's that's always a good springboard in that time of the year to show new work and kind of see the response you get from different people and uh, and hopefully pick up new collectors. And the Artesian is like a workshop and co-op kind of gallery, as I understand it. They do have a gallery across from the Artesian Hotel. Okay. And, and it's it and it does have workshops there for uh, practicing artists to display their work and how they do it and everything. And at last year's festival, which was the first one, you mentioned that you did a workshop. I did a workshop as far as giving a short speaking of, of how I do my work and everything. I didn't do any actual hands-on demonstrations of forging. I see. Um, tell us about the um, Chickasaw Artists um, Associate Advisory Group. That's a group I was asked uh, last year if I'd be interested in helping form that group to uh, to uh, specifically to get a, a traveling show, and I I was happy to to be a part of it myself and four others, and we formed the Chickasaw Advisory Group, which. Uh, We've put together a proposal which has been accepted to uh, travel one international show and I believe six other shows across the United States that that will have 12 Chickasaw artists with their different artwork and so it should be it should be really interesting and it will it will it will end up in sulfur it will be the final stop for it. So, and that with long, as, as it, well as advising other different aspects of, of art shows there in the, the Chickasaw Nation. So it's a, it's a real, real uh, opportunity to promote other Chickasaw artists and uh, highlight their work as well. That sounds really exciting. What's the overseas destination? We're not sure yet. It just was finalized this past month and the first thought is Paris but we're not sure if it's going to be Paris or London but it's uh, right. it, there's they're going to have to go and check all the venues yes <laughs> and hopefully you'll get to go and check out some venues <laughs> <laughs> um, how many how much of your business comes from just sales at booths and how much is from commissions actually all of them is is from sales at booths because I don't do any commissions and uh, I've just uh, I used to do a few commissions but then it just got to be so boring <laughs> and I, I like the interaction with customers with collectors and friends and I like to them to be able to see what I've got and handle it and say because it's functional art and and they can look and see and You've always got that unknown when you uh, do something on commission. I, is it really what they thought about in their head and everything? And uh, to me, it's too stressful. <laughs> I understand. Um, 
you were inducted into the Chickasaw Hall of Fame in 2009. What was that like? Uh, that's great. That was, uh, I couldn't believe it. Uh, governor called and said, you know, he, I was inducted into the Hall of Fame. He said into the Hall of Fame, and uh, I was laying on the couch one night when he called, and he he told me he said, Daniel, he said, just want to call and let you know, you know, you you've been inducted into the Hall of Fame, and uh, he told me when it was and everything, and to be there, and I hung up, and I, I said, well, thank you, that sounds great, and I I told Debbie, and she said, what, who are you talking to? And I said, I was talking to Governor Anatovy, and and he said I was. Um, one of the finalists for the Hall of Fame. And she said, so what does that mean? I said, well, I guess it means that, you know, there's probably six or seven people that they voted on and, and um, you know, they're going to pick one of them to be there. And I said, you know, uh, that, that sounds good, doesn't it? And she said, yeah. <laughs> and and then, then I got to thinking, well, I really don't know what he said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, and then, and then I thought I said that's less calling me and acting like that as a governor. That wasn't the governor calling me. And <laughs> then, I, then the next day, somebody else called me and make to make arrangements. And I said, I said, you mean I am inducted into the Hall of Fame? I said, I thought that was just kind of a, kind of a, a you know, a, a contest or something. And I said, no, you have been inducted. And I thought, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so I told Debbie, and she, she, so it, we were just, it was just uh, really a fun deal. Were your children able to go to? Yeah, they were all there, and my parents were there, and uh, okay. some of the relatives, and uh, you know, it was just a, it was just a fun experience all, all together. What, what do your folks think of your success with knives in our world? Well, uh, they are very, very proud uh, of what I've done. And, uh, and they're amazed, you know. Every time I, uh, I'll have a different knife, I might show it to them, or, or I've won a different award, you know, I'll tell them, and, and they just, you know, they're just, uh, you know, their only son, you know, they're proud. What <laughs> I know, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm happy that they were able to uh, see see me do some of my accomplishments. Do they have a few? I know your grandkids have one or two. Well, uh, they have one, yeah. Okay. And my grandkids each have one. And, uh, and actually, my, my grand, one of my grandsons, since he was born, I, I make miniatures, and so I've, I've made him one from the one ball of the billiard balls up to the eight ball. And every year I give them one up till he's 16, and then I'll make them a large one. That's a wonderful tradition to start. I understand your son also makes knives? Yeah, my youngest son, he, uh, oh, about eight or nine years ago, he, he came over one day and he said, you know, he'd like me to show him how to do one of my, to make a knife. So we got it out there on the forge and we spent all day and everything I did, he'd do. And, and he picked it up real quick and uh, I helped him fix up his shop and he's got a shop and and he lives about 10 miles from here but he he's really and he's developed his own style but I was really glad that he picked it up he's real artistic and he collects uh, Indian art and he's he's been exposed to Indian art since he was a baby was because uh, of, of our shows and everything we went to and so he's really got an eye for art and I'm proud of him. <laughs> right. Um, how has your work with knives, in a way, impacted your involvement with your Chickasaw culture? Well, I think it's really, uh, it's really been an asset. And as far as uh, it, it, one thing about the knives, it just opens up a new area as far as what other artists can do and I think it shows other artists that you might not have to uh, do things traditionally because whatever you do as an artist a lot of times for instance what I do I might make, be making my own traditions as I go and uh, so I think it lets other Chickasaw artists see that you can do all, a wide array of different types of art. 
And you went full time with your knives when? Around when? Uh, when, when I retired from AT and T. Which was around uh, three years ago. Oh. Yeah. So it's been that. Yeah, you've been on the show scene a long time, but only for three years have you been Ever doing been, it full time. Yes. Yes. And uh, so it's. Is uh, that a difference? Well, the difference is I don't go to work. <laughs> I come out to my studio <laughs> and I might check my garden <laughs> and then come in and forge a blade. I might check it all through the walk, take the dog a walk around the pasture. So it's really, it's really been great. And but as far as um, my uh, production, I've not done any more. Uh, I still take now. I'm able. I slow down a lot more. And I take things, I might not take chances as far as uh, having to do it in bad weather. Right. right. Whereas before it would, I would be doing things in bad weather, which I don't do now. And you've also done photography, I guess, all your life. And you well, since, since the uh, late 60s, uh, well, I'd get, when I got my first little Polaroid, and then I, in the 70s, Mid seventies, I got a thirty-five millimeter Canon, and then I've been kind of a, just really avid as a photographer since then, and I I enjoy taking photographs. Have you had any photography shows? No, I will. I've not any shows, but in an Exhibit C, I do have a have a a three-piece mural. Uh, hanging there that I did of a cigar store Indian and uh, it's been hanging there for about a year now and uh, but as far as any other shows I've done one local show and and but as for I've really not really been pursuing anything like that it's just something I get to do during the, the off months and kind of a hobby on a hobby or something like that I don't know but I really enjoy I do all my own photography as far as when I do uh, do an ad or anything like that. Right, and Gallery sees the one in Bricktown the, with the Chicks on Asian Yes, lines. it is. Well, let's talk about your process and techniques a little more. Um, I mean, your the beauty of your knives is just apparent, but when people know the process, it just seems even more impressive. And I read that you work with found materials, inclu including older steel, I wondered if you'd ever found like a newer piece of steel and uh, worked with it and how it held up. Well, uh, I have tried different different types of steel, all types of steel I've tried, but I've always went back to the uh, the old steel. Uh, I like old hair rakes. I've got some out back and I like the two teeth on them. They make really good steel. and. And you can, you know, after a while you can kind of feel the different texture. But uh, another one I like to use is old uh, uh, coil springs off of uh, Model A's and Model T's. They had the old coil springs under there. And that's just really excellent steel. But that's part of my process is locating old different steel and things like that. I really like to try the, the old. And pro plus it, it just seems like it provides a little bit of history in a knife. You, you can see like this this knife here that, that I've been working on, it's uh, it's from an old coil spring and you know it was found out in a junkyard but it's it's got new life into it. But, but the steel, I beat my steel down and I hammer the edges and you just keep hammering the edges and what it does, it compresses the molecules to make a better cutting edge. So even though um, you know, most people, they don't buy my knives to use, but yet they, they're very functional. And that was one of the things I learned in bladesmithing school, is how to just keep beating the steel to compress the molecules to where it makes a very, very fine cutting edge. Yes, because I've seen on the video the, the steel that you brought out of the forge, and it looks huge, of course, compared to your knives. And so you're just actually... Uh, beating it into that smaller and smaller shape. Right, that's really the first step is beating it down and of course it's a long piece on that particular piece which means you don't have to use any tongs and it's really easy to hold that piece. That, that particular piece was from an old um, 
truck spring that I'd split in half. And it, it you can make you know a longer piece with that, and but yeah, it's a uh, it gets the it's it's a lot of work. It's hard work and it's hot, but that, I like it hot when it gets hot here. I'll put my thermometer up and it may be like 135 degrees in front of that forge, but you know I'm sweating and it's just like uh, you know it's just exhilarating. You you just feel really alive, or I do when I start hammering. You know you just I just sweating and then you just keep hammering and hammering and you know you just feel real alive and and it, it, I don't know it's like it's like you've ran three or four miles and you just you just feel real good and drink you a whole pot of tea. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good workout. Um, you mentioned that um, in the video that you harden the steel in oil. Are you talking about cooking oil or motor oil? Or? I, I use motor oil. Okay. Yeah, I use motor oil and harden it in there. It, it provides a more, you know, you could use all kinds of mediums. You could use cooking oil, you could use water, you, know, you just all sorts of things as far as the type of steel I use. But the oil provides a, a, a quench to where it's not real sudden. Because you can, if you do it too sudden, you can actually cause the blade to just crack. Mm -hmm. And once you do harden it, if you, you're, I've got to be careful the time I get it back to the oven. Because if I, I have dropped them before and you know, just to shatter. And so you've spent a lot of work there and, mm -hmm. and you want to sit down there and just cry over your spilt milk. <laughs> <laughs> and so they go into the oven afterwards to for the final uh, after hardening. You take it after you after I forge it out, I'll um, I'll grind it out and get it all to the shape that I want have my file work. I do all my hand file work to make the designs and then I'll put it back in the fire to harden the blade and then I'll take the blade to, to when it's real hard as hard as it could be as you, it could just shatter. I'll bring it and put it in the oven and let it go back down to kneel it to like uh, the temperature where it's usable and it won't break. So then you've got your usable blade. Then it's ready to put whatever you want to put on it, the handle, the bolster, everything, it's ready there. So you've got a lot of hot, hard work up to that point. And then you get to do the fun stuff. <laughs> and it's like a kiln, I guess, the oven that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a small little okay. oven that, uh, that uh, you, you set it what temperature you want and it right. brings it right to that temperature and you've got a usable blade. My my thought was always, how do you make sure that the blade doesn't break from the handle? <laughs> oh, as far as the blade and the handle not breaking? Yes. Most Well, uh, every piece that I made is called a full tang, to where the steel and the blade are all one piece. All one piece. It's all one piece gotcha. so that that it's, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's not going to break. Right. Right. And you use coins, I understand, sometimes? I do. I use the, a lot of old, old handle and the blade. coins as far as that, like separating the handle from the blade. You've got like, a, that's an old Indian head nickel. And then all the, uh, uh, just different, different uh, things like that. Have you experimented much? You have that wonderful inlay look and lots of beautiful colors that you put together. But have you experimented much with texture with the same kinds of color and inlay or not any kind of texturing and i haven't done anything that would um uh you're talking about giving it a different feel mm -hmm. on the outside mm -hmm. on the outside uh with leather if you use leather i think i've done one with leather and it makes it a a different texture on the outside like you're talking about but it's actually doing anything like that would be a more traditional type where mm -hmm. they did use leather mm -hmm. and things. Mm -hmm. But most of mine when you're through it's it's just smooth to where you just right. it looks like it's all one deal. And and, and as far as and I ha have done I haven't done any in a long time but the small miniature Indian corn mm -hmm. I've done nice with those and Oh, for the handle. For the handle. And it looks like a photograph, but it's actually different colors. The corn wow. makes different colors, and that's, it makes a pretty neat. But still, the texture's all smooth. You know, I wonder if you were looking for an influence in how you ended up with um, 
the knife handles that you like, would it have come from jewelry? Would it have come from beadwork? Would it have come from other places? Yes, or? it would. I, I've, I've uh, asked myself that, and I've, it would come from jewelry. It would come from, uh, I, always, I, I collect old baskets, Indian baskets, and it would come that, and I collect old rugs, Navajo rugs, and all those kind of influenced me on my handles. But yeah, you're right. How much time do you spend actually just looking for materials? Well, I, it, it, that's just kind of uh, an everyday thing anymore. You know, if uh, wherever I go, uh, usually <laughs> on weekends, I'd like to make a garage sale, estate sale, and if I find something, I'll get it. And just uh, driving down the road, if I see something <laughs> out in the pasture <laughs> that might, might work, I'll get it. But uh, I, I look for old steel. And as far as the silver, I like to use uh, a lot of my, I bought a lot of old uh, silver spoons and, and different types of uh, teapots and things like that. Anytime I see anything sterling, I'll buy it. And that's pretty much uh, what I, I've got a whole bunch of like uh, coin silver also in 1802 to 1830 type spoons that I use. And, and that all works into an old piece. You know, you've got something that's new, but yet it's old. You've got an old material all in it. And then the, even the billiard balls, like 40s and 50s pool halls and things that came out of it. Right. Like you mentioned, it's got this, the history and the story. Have you ever bought, I was thinking of all the agricultural equipment that you do see resting out in the field. Have you ever got things from your neighbors close by? Well, uh, actually my dad, I, I, he supplies me in a lot of those. He, he's, uh, I helped him with his uh, antique uh, auction for 25 years. Every year, he, that's, that's what my dad does since he retired. He buys up uh, antiques. Oh, okay. And so I learned a lot about different antiques. And, and since he's done that, he's acquired a lot of old palm jewelry and things like that. And Indian rugs and baskets and jewelry. And, and so that's kind of worked interconnected there so but he's always come up with different farm equipment and uh, when he gets something new he'll holler at me and I'll go look at it and <laughs> yeah I'll buy that from you. That's a that's a good relationship there. But but as far as materials there's never really I've never had a shortage of materials but when I started you know I was using stuff like that simply because it was kind of high to go buy all that stuff but I could find stuff and, it, and you know, you, for next to nothing. And so that I, I think that's how it worked out, but I like doing it that way, and so I've never changed. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> what kind of impact do you want your knives to have on the viewer when they see them? Well, every, every person has a different, uh, you know, interpretation of what you do and everything. And... Uh, and when they see it, they, um, they, most of them say, "I, I just, uh, I, I can't believe that uh, that these are knives." I said, that, "I've never seen knives like this," and uh, that makes me feel good. I, I like to know that I'm doing something that maybe no one else has done, and uh, and so that that surprise, and uh, I see a lot of surprise, and I see a lot of. Uh, admiration of it and appreciation for for turning old stuff into new stuff and so it's it's good to to get the feedback that's that's one of the things that you like being one on one with a collector and also i'm struck by like the shape sometimes of your handles and i don't know what you call it when we'll be looking at one that has kind of a split like a almost like a fin to um in a minute, but I'm wondering what inspired that. Well, I, I like to do just uh, animal shapes, and uh, a lot of my pieces I'll kind of incorporate in the shape of maybe a fish, okay. or a bird, or a snake, or a woodpecker, things like that, you know. And it, and so you're consciously channeling those. Yes, shapes. yes, yes. Living out here in the country like I do, you know, yeah. I, 
it's great to be, I, I kind of like to think I'm close to the land, Clo you know, and and, uh, and just every day you see things out as you walk in the pasture. I, I walk out in the pasture every day and and I just see different things like, like for instance, I've lived here since 63 on this same property, but every year I see something different as far as a new species of plant or even a, some kind of insect or a bird or something. You just it just never quits changing, and so I, that's kind of like my work. I, I, I want it's going to keep evolving. I'm never going to get to a spot to where this is try to keep it the same because I don't really want to keep it the same. And a lot of times when I when I I'll start forging a blade and stuff, uh, I'll just purposely do something to it to make a mistake, and then I have to work around that mistake to make it to what I to something different. But if I don't make a mistake sometimes, I'm afraid, well, it's going to turn out like the last one. And I don't want to turn out like the last one, so I'll put a notch here, or I'll cut it off short here or something, or make a funny angle on it, and then I say, well, and sometimes I think, wow, I've really messed this up. How am I going to fix this? <laughs> but it always, it always lets you get, let your mind find new avenues to make something into a finished product. That is neat. Do you take photographs of every single knife that you do? Do you keep a photographic record? You don't. I don't. It, it, it's just too much trouble. <laughs> it would it would have been nice, I guess, and uh, and I, I couldn't tell you how many knives I've made or or. But it, when I see one that I've made, I can definitely say I made that because I mean, I've done that before. Is somebody bring a knife by and say I. Uh, wonder who made that or something, you know, at a show, and I say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What is your creative process from the time that you get an idea? Well, it's just pretty much, I'll, I'll, if I get an idea about a piece, I'll just uh, start forging on it and forge the blade out to that shape. And uh, if I've got particular colors in mind, I'll, uh, it, it could, I could all, a lot of times I'll see it before I ever start. And you see it in your head, you're yeah. not writing anything down. No, I don't write anything down. I'll see it in, in my head and I'll, I'll go that process. And then a lot of times I'm just building, forging a blade and seeing what happens. And it just kind of comes along and I say, hmm, this color would be neat. <laughs> and then I'll go to sleep on it and I'll say, oh. I'm glad I didn't finish it then yesterday because this color will be a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> so I found that if I to leave one sitting overnight or a couple of days when I'm really not sure, it's a pretty good idea because then I'll have a better idea where I'm really sure of what I want to do with it. When I'm not really sure about something, it's kind of, I don't know if I should do that or not. But And then when I do finish a piece, I may not really see exactly what I did with it, but I'll let, let it set a couple of days and I'll look at it and I'll say, hmm, and then, hmm, I, I see something there I didn't know I put there. I didn't know why I did that, but that looks neat. I like that. And, you know, it's just uh, a lot of times I, I make something and I'm really not sure, uh, you know, was I conscious in, in what I was doing. <laughs> Do you work simultaneously on several, or is it one at a time? Do you one just follow one all the way through? Yeah, I like doing one at a time and uh, and just uh, taking my time with it and uh, seeing seeing how I you know how I can bring it along and everything. But uh, I, I have done two or three at a time in the beginning when I when I was starting and everything, and, and I found that I don't really like doing that at all. And, you know, because you just can't. I think I have to devote one, all my time to one piece, and when it's done, move on to another one. Well, looking back on your career so far, what do you think has been a turning point for you when you could have gone one way and you went another? I think really the uh, turning point was when I discovered different materials and different colors with my with my blades and, and shapes even, as far as, uh, because I wasn't really uh sure to if I should go into that area or not, but I think that was a good turning point. What's been one of the high points in your career? 
Well, High Points was uh, definitely being uh, inducted to the Hall of Fame and uh, being chosen the honorable one at Red Earth was was fantastic and uh, winning the Challenge Award on, on the Peace in Santa Fe was, was really a, a, a nice uh, award and uh, so and then then I've had you know a lot of other uh, uh, first places out there which I'm always happy even a third or an honorable mention I'm happy to get but, but it's nice when others recognize what you do. What's been one of the low points of your career? Oh, low points. I, I don't. I guess the low point was probably when they didn't know if they was going to let me in that show or not. <laughs> 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 but, but as far as a low point, I, I've never really had any low points, is because uh, you know you, it's just life's too exciting and every day's an adventure. So, yeah, I, you know, I might have a low point maybe a couple of hours or. A, or a day maybe, but then I'm, it's kind of like getting bucked off of a horse, you know. If you, you just get back on and, you know, it's a new adventure, a new ride, and so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there anything we've forgotten or anything you'd like to add before we look at one of your knives? Oh, knives? Uh, no, I think I've uh, talked enough. <laughs> okay, we'll take a look at your knives Okay. Here. Okay, hey, you want to tell us about this knife, Daniel? This is uh, Stars and Stripes. I completed this last month. Mm -hmm. And the handle was fashioned from old dominoes and old billiard balls. Uh, hand done file work decorates the top of the spine and goes all the way around the blade. Right. And, and the blade was forged from an old found steel pickup coil spring. And it has an old uh, Indian head nickel separating the blade and the handle. And. Uh, the red is from old dominoes and the blue is from billiard balls. And it has white composite paper separating each piece. Beautiful. And I notice you, you have titles for your knife. I yes, I, I do like to title each piece and uh, and it, you know, it just uh, its process makes it more it. unique. Right. Okay, here we're looking at another one. This is entitled Chameleon and it, I titled it that because the back is diff completely different than this. The back is red and orange. And this knife was handled with fashion from a combination of old billiard balls and old found dominoes. The blade was forged by hand from an old found coil spring taken off an old abandoned Model T. Functional firework motif decorates the spine of the blade with a nickel, ending head nickel separating the blade from the handle. Mm, that's beautiful too. We're looking at the other side here, as yes. you said. Yes. yes, this is the other reverse side of Chameleon. Yeah. Oh, those are gorgeous colors. Oh, this one's really different looking, the handle. And you, you, you called it Four Red Moons? This is Four Red Moons, and uh, I named it for Four Red Moons. It's, uh, the knife was forged by hand, by hammer, and forged from an old... Model T's coil. Oh, wow. The, the handle was fashioned from bone with red dye, and old Indian head nickel separates the blade from the handle. And uh, I did, it's the other side's pretty much the same, but it's separated in four pieces as far as the four different pieces of bone. And I'd entitled it Four Red Moons simply because last year and this year the Tetra uh, blood moons were happening, and I just thought, well, that's neat. Four right. blood moons. I'm going to call this four red moons. That is beautiful. And how about this one? This is purple sky, and it's a knife blade was forged by hand from an old found pickups coil spring. The handle was fashioned from old billiard balls. Firework decorates the spine of the blade and travels completely around the handle. An old Indian head nickel separates the blade from the handle also, and. Uh, uh, to get all those purple colors, I might add, is very difficult from billiard balls because the outside of billiard balls aren't always what they look like on the inside. And it depends on the environment they were in. Oh, as wow. far as cigarette smoke, how much light was coming in. But to get the dark purple is very, very rare, I found out. And, uh, so, uh, and then the purple sky, the name on that was simply because I 
I was listening to uh, Hank Williams' uh, song and uh, a, f a falling star lights up a purple sky, and uh, I thought, wow, that's neat. I like the way that sounds, and so I named him Purple Sky. <laughs> that's a great title. Well, thank you so much for your, well, maybe let's look at that last one that has the, um, Oh, okay, the one that's, yeah, the one that's out. Oh, okay, this one. We talked about. This is one that I just finished, actually, and it's, uh, I don't know where I can put it here. I can just, uh, okay, uh there, yeah, you can just okay. hold it, great. It's, it's forged from an old coil steel of a truck spring, and it's got orange and billiard ball, black dominoes, and red dominoes. And it's, um, it's a double-edged piece, and the design on it was just uh, kind of whimsical, just, uh, mm -hmm. just, uh, just to put different shapes in it. And the other side is pretty much the same with white laminated paper as far as filling in between. It does have a nice, whimsical feeling. All right, well, thank you for your time today. Okay, I've got two more you want to see. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, those are this is so my, nice. This is my woodpecker. Different. Okay. Yeah, that's woodpecker as far as the design and old billiard ball. Plus dominoes, <laughs> but it really it's it. very functional as far as your where your fingers fit. Right, that is gorgeous. I see where the ridge is. Oh, wonderful! And that was a kind of a whimsical piece. Yeah. This here is Arizona ironwood, which uh, I like to use wood as far as being a very very pretty type wood which is Arizona ironwood but sometimes I like to put it with a different type of blade and this blade has uh, firework going all the way around the blade and the handle right. and, and it's just a n different type shape piece that very functional and uh, I've had people that like maybe this type of blade as far as cheese knives. I was going to say, you can use that in the kitchen. It yes, looks like. yes, it's very easy much to good. Manipulate. Okay, well, I really appreciate your time today. Well, Thank you're you. very welcome. I'm, I'm glad you came. <laughs>